together. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Show yourself friendly, reach across the aisle, greet one another.
quick announcement for our church family. Just want to remind you that the deadline to order chocolate-covered strawberries is next Sunday. So if you have not ordered your strawberries yet, please see any member of our youth department, and they'll be happy to sell you an order. Uh, it's one dozen for $20, and uh, those orders need to be submitted by next Sunday. At this time, we're going to worship the Lord in our giving. Ushers, if you can make your way forward at this time. And if you would like to give this morning, there's three ways to give. You can use a tithing envelope there at the back of the pew or do text to give. The number is listed on the screen. Visit the website at porterabc.org. And when the ushers come with the bags, if you'd be so kind, just simply pass the bag all the way down to the other end of the pew. And uh, they'll be happy to receive it on that end and send it back. But let's take a moment right now and pray over our offering today. Loving Master, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you for another opportunity to bring our tithes and offerings into your storehouse. We pray, Lord, that you would bless it and multiply it many times for your kingdom and the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. And if you would like prayer this morning for healing, we invite you to come forward at this time. Let's worship with them as they lead us in song.
of abundance ray. I can hear the sound. I can hear the sound you say. I can hear the sound of abundance ray. I can hear the sound. 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 I can hear the sound of abundance ray. I can hear the sound. I can hear the sound. I can hear the sound of abundance ray. I can hear the sound. I can hear the sound.
there's a song. We're gonna, I'm going to have them sing it one more time before we bring Bishop Huntley. That, that song we used to sing says it's going to be worth every long mile. Every heartache and every trial. You know what? I read all through that word cover to cover, and I hadn't read of anybody that ever did anything easy. Every person I've ever seen that walked away with a victory went through something. If they'd have had a choice, they'd have probably rather not went through. And some of it didn't make sense, and some of it wasn't fair. Sometimes God puts you through things. It's not about being fair. He just knows the thing he's got to put you through is the only thing that's going to turn you into what he wants you to be. And sometimes he don't ask us. He says, look, you're not going to like it, but you're not going to be in it by yourself. You just keep walking, and when I'm done, it'll make sense on the other side. Paul said, I've been shipwrecked a night and a day I spit in the deep. I've been hurt by friends. I've been hurt by enemies. I've been beaten. I've been whipped. I've been persecuted. I've been in prison. I've been in prison falsely. He says all that. And we'd be like, oh, you ought to write a bit more about that, the things you've been through. He said, oh, no, 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 no. These things are not worthy to be compared to what is waiting on the other side. Nobody's gonna be in little corners of heaven talking about what they went through. They're gonna be walking around saying it was nothing. It was worth everything. It wasn't a thing, my goodness. I thought it was, I was worried about if it was gonna be worth it. Oh, my, if I'd have known this, I'd have made my decision sooner. I'd have given up everything sooner. If I'd have known this is what was on the other side. They took John, they put John on the Isle of Patmos, boiled him alive in oil. And boy, somebody must, you, you read the book of Revelation. He gives you that much scripture about what he went through. Oh yeah, John, yeah, they did this, they did this, and they exiled me. Oh, how was it? He said, no, no, I don't want to talk about that. Let me tell you what I saw. Let me tell you about heaven. I don't want to talk about what I went through. If you saw what I saw on the other side, I, I got this many verses, and I'd rather spend them all talking about heaven because what I saw that's waiting on the other side, everything I've been through doesn't even get a whole verse. But let me tell you about heaven. I wish for just a little while you'd make up your mind. I don't know what you're going through, but it's going to be worth it. I don't know who did you wrong, but you're going to make it. I don't know what's kept you down, but you come. You know what I feel? I told Brother Marks last night even before he got up, I said, I feel like we've been in it by sitting on the edge of a volcano, and that smoke is just pouring out. And it's just been a matter of time till that thing erupts. Those volcanoes erupt. They don't stay in one place. They cover everything around. It changes the landscape. It's not going to stay in your neighborhood. It's not just going to stay in your home. It's going to go into your family. It's going to go to work. It's going to go into our schools. It's going to go into our college. It's going to go where you work. It's going to go to your friend's house. It's going to go into the houses of people. It, you can't stop it. But I'm telling you, it's time to let God be God and every man a liar and let God God heal everybody he wants to heal save who he wants to save and do whatever he wants to do and it's here I want them to see that one more time and whatever it is you walked in here with whatever it is it's oh man I just lift up your eyes to the hills from which cometh your help you're not stuck you're not out of options. You're not at the end of a dead end street with nowhere to go. Oh. When he's involved, he said, I am the door, I am the way. If you need a way out, here I am. He said, I make all things new. Why don't we just begin to worship him one more time? Why don't we get our minds on what's waiting on the other side and realize whatever I'm going through, it's going to be worth it. Whatever I made it through, it's going to be worth it. What's it going to be like when that pain leaves your body? What's it going to be like when your family walks through that door? What's it going to be like when all of a sudden that depression is gone?
Sing everybody will be happy. Somebody that's still happy about going there. Hey, everybody will be happy. We'll be happy over that we will. We will shout and sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over there. Texas this morning. What a joy it is to be here. You're welcome to make your way back to your seats at this time. What a great spirit of praise and worship in this sanctuary right now. There he is. Remain standing if you would. I'll get quickly to the word of the Lord. I am a proponent of ancestral curses, but I also am a proponent of ancestral blessings where there is compounded anointing, compounded like interest that just keeps piling up, piling up because of investment, because of consistency, because of faithfulness, because of a love for truth, there is in many auditoriums a compounded, anointed, ancestral blessing of God on this church. It started with 13 people. And Bishop and Sister Green and their family. And it's been added to and added to and added to. And then the 
undeniable, unexplainable, without duplication of Joel McCoy. When you bring him into the fa bring him into the formula, you just elevated everything to another level. I want to make my remarks quickly get to the word of the Lord. I, I want to say how much I appreciate and thank God for the legacy, the history, the foundation, and the ongoing apostolic revivals represented here by the lifetime co contribution of Brother and Sister Green who are here this morning. How thrilling it is to see them. Rarely do I get around folks that make me feel young. Matter of fact, in the last five, seven years or so, every place I go, I'm the oldest preacher there. Like, oh, Lord. But when I come to Porter and I get around Brother and Sister Green, I have a seasonal flashback. And I go back to my youthful days of ministry. And I remember powerful presentations of the spirit of this place. Of course, it wasn't in this place. It was in a little humble building, but the glory of God would come and great things would happen. And so I am feeling, if you will indulge me this morning, I'm not going to apologize for it because I don't feel this way everywhere I go, but I feel a season of ministerial youth upon me today. So what that means is I am not going to preach like an old worn-out apostolic preacher. preach like a 32-year-old evangelist that used to be in this body. And so I'm alerting the church this morning. Be on standby. Be alert. I know it's Sunday morning, but God is not a respecter of day or time. It doesn't have to be dark for God to pour out His Spirit. It doesn't have to be Sunday night, is what I'm saying. So I am going to preach today. Thank you for always the wonderful, marvelous welcome and privilege to be here. I love coming here. It's a joy. This is a great, great place. I will preach more about that in my message this morning. But I, I, Brother and Sister Green and maybe Brother McCoy and a few others that are here, if you remember the ministry of a great man of God in times gone by, by the name of R.E. Johnson. Would you raise your hand? Any of you get to hear the marvelous ministry of R.E. Johnson? If you didn't, if you can go back and find it, would be a cassette tape. But if you could find a cassette tape with some of Brother R.E. Johnson's preaching on it, Brother Johnson was a country preacher before country was cool. I mean, he invented the word country. And he, he maximized it, and he used it to his advantage. So one time I heard him, and I'm going to borrow this this morning for my introductory statement to you, just to season you to get ready for where we're going to go in the Word. Brother Johnson said, you know, there are 747 preachers. They take a long runway to get up. He said, I'm a helicopter preacher. I'm a helicopter preacher. I don't need a runway. I go straight up. So on this Sunday morning, don't be expecting a long runway here today. I'm anticipating after what you've been experiencing, we're just going to go straight up this morning. Clap your hands and shout amen. When God called me to preach, I had no training. I had no great examples. I had no great heritage. I just had to feel my way through this and develop by the grace of God whatever he would give me. But I did make a promise to the Lord that was a bit daring. And if you know me, I have been daring in my ministry. I have been daring. I mean, when you go to Raleigh, North Carolina with five people and don't get a job, that's pretty daring. My wife and I went to Raleigh to start the church with five people. 
She said, you going to get a job? I said, I got a job. I got to reach this city. I said, this is more of a full-time job than evangelizing. And if God doesn't know we're here, we're in trouble. But by the grace and goodness of God, I refuse to go to a second. I'm not advertising that for young preachers. Don't try that. That's God tells you that. Actually, the first year we in Raleigh, we made more personal income in the first year in a church of five people than we did the last year of evangelizing. That's nothing but God. Of course, I'm talking about a whopping ten thousand dollars. <laughs> that was about what I was making back then, ten thousand dollars. So I'm telling you, I promised God. I said, God, I don't know how this is all going to turn out with this preaching stuff. But here's the way I'm going to operate. If you will give me one word, I will preach that word and trust you with the results. So there again, I'm getting on the tightrope this morning, the thin ice. This is either going to be a, a bust or a thrust. I'm not sure. But I'm going, to, I'm going to preach today about one word that God spoke to me for the Porter Apostolic Church. I'm preaching to this church this morning. Tonight I will broaden the message to all the guests that will be here. I have a word for the Porter Apostolic Church, and it is just one word. Stay tuned. I'll give it to you in a minute. 1 Samuel chapter 30. Good to be with Brother Jennings. What a talented, gifted man of God he is. And I salute him and thank him for his ministry. Great preacher of the word, too. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6 through 8. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. And David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Isn't that a great scripture we've always enjoyed? And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now, generally, when I read that part, that's one of our favorite parts. We're going to get it all back. We're going to get it back. But let's continue with the word of the Lord in verse number 18 now. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. And David recovered all. And this is what I'm going to preach about this morning. I've disappointed you because you wanted me to preach about recovery. And David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drave before those other cattle, and said, this is mine. He called it his spoil. David said, now, now, this part right here is mine. I want to preach to you a little bit on David's participation award. David's participation award. Put your Bible down. Give the Lord a great big hand clap right now and bless his name. And everybody shout amen. amen. You may be seated. I'm fully aware that God deals with ministry in the context of their personality, their intelligence, their, their life, their background, their emotional makeup in the preaching of a message. I do believe the greatest miracle God ever created was the making of a man of God. But right alongside that is the making of a message from God. How God can give a man a word from heaven. 
I've often been impressed, intrigued with the unusual manner in which a message is born. Every preacher here will attest to the fact that sometimes it comes from the most unlikely places. I had a young man ask me one time after years of ministry, Oh, Brother Huntley, I love to hear you preach. How much do you study? How many hours a day do you study? I said, Well, let me tell you the truth. I said, You, you interrupted my study when you asked that question. I said, Because I'm studying 24 7. My mind is open, my eyes are open, my spirit is open, my heart is open. I'm looking to hear from God everywhere I go, everything I see, everything I do. So sometimes the messages come in some very unusual ways, at least for me. I was sitting in a service one time a few years ago, and there was a young man, a man trying to lead the worship, trying to arouse interest and emotion and response from the audience. And in the mic, he just kept screaming. I won't scream, but he kept screaming, let's make some noise. Let's make some noise. Come on, let's make some noise. Now, I told you I've been in this a long time, kind of dinosauric. And in my uh, previous life, that just graded me. Now, don't, don't grieve me now because I'm getting ready. To, I'm setting you up. I'm a nice guy. I'm, I'm not going to get you in this trap. But if you, if you respond positively to what I just said, you're, you're ready, getting ready to call it a trap. So I'm just trying to let you know. Don't, don't get excited right here. I thought, noise. Make noise. We ain't going to make noise here. We've come here to praise God. We've come here to worship God. You're up there screaming, make noise, make noise, make noise. And I kept that, as it would say in North Carolina, that thing got to eating on me. It just got to chewing on me. Make noise, make noise, make noise. Hey, yeah, make noise. Hey, y'all make noise. Hey, make noise. It bothered me so much that a verse of Scripture came to my mind. <laughs> Make a joyful. <laughs> Make a joyful. Make a joyful. So I became convinced that that young man was right on target. The Bible said when we come into the house of the Lord, we are to make a joyful noise. Church is supposed to be noisy. It's not quiet. It's not dead. We're to make a joyful noise. So that got to eating on me so much, I started studying about it. And I was sitting in a service one day with Bishop Kenneth Haney preaching. He and I were doing a conference somewhere, and he read that text where the, the four leprous men attacked the city of Syria. They were dying of leprosy, weak, anemic, body parts maybe falling off, and could hardly walk, but they said, why sit we here till we die? Let's charge the city. What we gotta lose? We stay here, we're gonna die. We get there, we're gonna die. The worst thing we do is die. Let's go. And God was so impressed with their passion to pursue that the Bible seemed to indicate that God turned the PA set on and amplified their Four footfall of fleeting, failing flesh. And as they charged towards Syria, the Bible said the Syrians heard the noise of chariots, the noise of soldiers. And they said, all of our enemies have conspired and they're coming against us together. And they gathered up their stuff. They left supper on the table. They left everything ready. And they headed out of Dodge. And when the lepers got there, there was nothing. Everything was clear left for them. But I want you to understand, the Bible said all the Syrians heard was the noise of chariots. Hear me, noise of soldiers. Ladies and gentlemen, there were no chariots. There were no soldiers. All they heard was noise. And that noise was enough to drive their enemy out. And so I preach to you quickly, there is power in noise. There is power in noise. Don't ever criticize a loud service. Don't ever criticize, criticize loud shouting. Don't ever criticize loud amens. There's power in noise.
Well, then the same thing happened to me not long ago. I just, you know, I pay attention to words. Words bother me. Major problem I have with me and my wife is I speak one language and she understands another. Can I get a witness? I know what I said, but I don't know what you heard. Right? And I get all bum fuzzled up with words sometimes. You know, I've often thought, man, we could leave here this morning and say, my gracious brother McCoy, what a great day it was to be in your church. Y'all had a packed out house. There's a few of you with me. I can say this is a packed out house, or I can say this is a packed out house. It just depends on what you heard. One lady was standing at the door and the pastor got through. She said, oh, pastor, what a message. You fed my soul. And this other man said, yeah, I got a belly full of it too. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it just, it's words. It's words. So a few years ago in America, they started what they call participation awards. Man, it started grading on me because I'm a competitor. Somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to lose. Somebody's got to shout victory. Somebody's got to suffer defeat. But then they said, no, no, no. This is a participation award. All you have to do is get involved. All you have to do is participate. After COVID, we were left with some very detrimental, residual, negative spiritual fallout, which we have not yet completely conquered in Pentecost. We're still suffering some of those negative effects one of which was the unknown, previously unseen, called spectator syndrome in Pentecost, which many people started what they call watch parties. They'd invite people to their homes and let's watch church. It's a watch party. The problem with that is it, didn't, it left the home and it came to the church. Now, Brother Jennings, you write this down because you can make a million off this. I'm fixing to give you a song. You got your pen and paper? Get ready. You're going to like this. I got just a few lines to a song that's going to be number one in the world. Not by my voice, but by his voice. Here's the way it goes. He's an online God. Oh, yes, he is. He's an online God. Yes, he is. I may not be there Sunday morning, but I'm watching just the same because he's an online God. Yes, he is. I've come to preach to you this morning. Pentecost is not a spectator sport. Nobody is blessed by watching. There are no awards for just watching. The awards go to those who are participating. Now with all of that introduction stuff behind me, let me begin to preach to this church. This is a uniquely spiritually empowered, invested, apostolic, miraculous, and excuse me for using this term, I know you're not gonna like it, but I'm gonna say it anyway because it fits my message, Porter Apostolic Church is the greatest show on earth. By that I mean, it's easy for you to come here with such dynamic, spirit-driven, large church as this with powerful, entertaining, apostolic, inspiring preaching, prolific and proficient music, impeccable leadership, and a segment of the assembly poised on the edge of the pews, ready to run with just a flick of a sign. There is, a, there is an element in this church. Always has been. All you have to do is give them the signal. They home. I'll never forget one time Brother Libby was preaching to me in a little bitty church we had there in North Carolina. And Brother Libby was a master at getting people to respond. Little bitty church. He, he couldn't hardly shout. And they were so full, so crowded. He said about 10, other ushers, open those doors. He said in 10 minutes, about 20 people are going to leave this building. He said they're going to run out of this building and they're going to be dancing in the parking lot and up and down the streets. He preached about 10 minutes, and he said, now. And when he said now, about half the congregation left. 
and they were running up and down the street. They were shouting in the parking lot. We never even got them back in. Church was officially over. But I've been around Portland enough to know there's enough young people, there's enough young preachers, there's enough fired up apostolics. All I need to do in just a moment is say, now. And when I say now, they're going to run the aisles with record-breaking speed. They're going to leap these altars. They're going to bounce off the platform. They're going to run around this building. They're going to dance in the spirit because they know the blessing doesn't come to the watchers. The blessing comes to the participators. Well, it's off and running. That's what I'm talking about. You don't see that everywhere, even in Pentecost. You don't see that everywhere, even in Pentecost. But I want to emphasize, you don't get blessed by watching. You get blessed by participating. Remain standing just a moment. I'm about to get started preaching now. I see, sister, if I, if I, if I mispronounce your name, please forgive me. Sister Lusty, uh, what is it, Lester, Lusty, Lusty, I thought her name the way she was lusting after God, it would be Lusty, <laughs> praising God with such a passion, lusting after the spirit, Lusty, I watched her a while ago, it confirmed my message, it blessed my spirit. Because the longer she danced, the happier she got. I watched her face, and the more freedom she got, the bigger her smile got, the greater the dance came, the greater the joy came. You don't get that by watching, you get that by participating. See, this is what the Lord spoke to me. One word. This is what I want you to preach to the church in Porter. I haven't been here in a year, I think. I appreciate God giving me a word. He gave me a word. Most of this I wrote on an airplane. That's the reason it's not nicely done, you know. Handwritten, can't hardly read it. I was writing it on an airplane. About to run the aisle. I felt like running the aisle. God said, this is a church that represents the greatest apostolic show on earth. It is easy for you to come in here from other Pentecostal churches, nestle in here, get you a nice nest, be comfortable, and know you don't have to shout, somebody is. No, you don't have to worship, somebody is. You want to go home and brag about how wonderful it was, you got a blessing out of watching it. But here's the word of the Lord to your assembly without even talking to you. The next dimension in Porter will be predicated upon your participation. God said the only thing lacking is a higher level of participation. I'm saying that in faith and confidence that you'll receive it. There is unprecedented revival, evangelism, and church growth if you will just participate. There is no blessing, no bonus, no benefit in watching. The blessing is in participating. That's why he said, clap your hands, all you people. That's why he said, let everything that hath breath. There is no blessing in watching. Turn around somebody and say, get with it. That's what it means to participate. Get a hold of it. Get connected. Get involved. Get out of the bleachers. Come out of the bleachers. Get on the field. You may be seated just a moment. I had people say, did you see that? Did you see what she did? Did you see what he did to a child? No, I didn't see it. I was worshiping God. Feel too much liberty here. <laughs> no, I'm going to go. 
David came back. His wives and his children were gone. He said, God, shall I overtake them? Should I go after them? And the Lord simply said, pursue. Which meant, go for it. Nike, just do it. That's what God said. Just, just do it. Go for it. Get after them. And I promise you, this was God's promise. You shall without fail recover all. Everybody say, that was the promise. You're going to get it all back. That was a trap. You're going to get it all back. Now, in North Carolina and around the United States where I go to preach, the spiritual theme of the religious world right now is recovery. Every, just about every city you'll see signs, marquees, and churches, recovery classes. Almost every, I'm not preaching against that. Almost every church has some form of a recovery class. But I want to tell you, God wants to deliver the apostolic church from the race of recovery. From the rat race of recovery. Because when you recover, you only get back to ground zero. When you recover, you only get back what you have previously had. God does not want this apostolic church continually fumbling and recovering. Always looking back over our shoulder and trying to go back and recover, recover, recover. I don't know that that's in this church, but let me say it anyway. There's a reason why your front wheel uh, windshield is larger than your rear view mirror. Because you need to be more focused on what's ahead of you than what is behind you. As great as our past was, our future is greater. As glorious as our past was, our future is more glorious. God does not want the apostolic church involved with recovery as much as he wants us to be involved with discovery. Job 29 and 2. I hope I gave that to them. Job 29 and 2. It's a good verse. It's worth waiting on. I probably didn't get it on. It's my fault. I should probably jump in the baptistry and drown myself. <laughs> it's a disaster. <laughs> Can you get that verse? Job said, after he had lost his kids, his everything, he said, oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. I see this, Brother Green, as a, as a prayer of Job. He was saying, God, if I could just get back what I've lost. I've lost so much. God, if I could just have a if I could just have a recovery. God in essence said, Job, that's a prayer I'm not going to answer. Because that's not what I have in mind for you. I don't have recovery in mind for you. The Bible said in Job 42 and 10 that God gave him twice what he had. God's plan for us is not to recover something we've left in the past, but to get something we've never had before. God wants to take you not where you've been, but where you've never been. 
God wants to make you, doesn't want to make you what you used to be. He wants to make you what he wants you to be. He wants to bless you like you've never been blessed. He wants to make you double. Somebody shout yes. yes. I'm feeling after the spirit and I'm gonna watch time too, but I'm just, because one time I preached a message camp meeting years ago and boy, I felt so good about it. I don't usually, I'm not impressed with my preaching, never have been. I'm never listening to myself preach, I hate it. <laughs> I don't listen to it. I was riding in the dark shadows of a night in British Columbia, going back to a little motel where we stand out in the woods. Man, that night God had helped me, blessed me. Man, I had swung on the moon and hung my coat on the Milky Way. I mean, I'd, and I'd got all these new revelations. We're riding along there, and my wife's sitting beside me, and I'm driving along. She's sitting there, and I said, I went to fishing. Any preachers ever go fishing? I went fishing. I said, my Lord, honey, what church tonight? You would have thought I was in a car by myself. I said, what a great service. What a dynamic anointing. Man, I got all kind of new points. Ladies and gentlemen, they just weren't biting. So finally I said, she said two words in the darkness. Too long. Anybody ever been humbled that way before? Yeah. Too long. I said, but honey, God gave me all them new points. They were all new stuff I never seen before. She said, great, wonderful. Leave the old ones out. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do at Porter this morning is decide which ones I ought to leave out. But I do know the message to this church right now for the next phase is for not you to gather here from all over the world and just be mesmerized and blown away. So have you ever heard such singing? Have you ever heard such preaching? Have you ever heard such music? Have you ever seen such a building? Have you ever seen such people worship? And just sit there and, and watch it and watch it and watch it when there is no blessing in watching. The blessing is in participation. I don't care how beautiful a meal is. I don't care how much it smells. I don't care how beautiful it's presented. The blessing is in the partaking. It's in the participation. God's calling for people that haven't shouted to shout. Folks that haven't danced to dance. Folks that haven't run the aisles to run the aisles. Folks that haven't had revival to have revival. Could I get a few more seniors to join this man right here and show this young generation the blessing is in participation. It's in participation. It's not in just watching. It's not in just sitting there. You can watch this, but you won't feel what they're feeling. You can watch this, but you won't get what they're getting. You can watch this, and you won't experience what they are experiencing because the blessing is in participating. didn't even tell you about my text God told David he said go get them you shall recover all but when David started coming back he cut out of that herd a certain section of sheep and goats and he said now we recovered all as God said uh, but this part right here that's David's participation award. That's what I get for being involved. 
You see, when you get involved, you don't just get back what you lost. You get what you never had. God wants to take you where you've never been. God wants to show you what you've never seen. God wants to give you what you've never had. I want somebody to get out of right now and say, I want my participation award. Clap your hands. Shout unto God. Dance in the Spirit. Glorify His name. The bonus, the benefit, the blessing is in participation. Anybody ever felt like you were cursed? Had a curse on you? I'm cursed with vision. It refuses to leave me satisfied. I can't stay anywhere very long and it be okay. Whatever we arrive at or whenever we have a great service or we have a, it lasts for a little while and then there's this thing in me, I didn't put it in, I didn't ask it, it's looking for what's further. But in today's society, it comes across like a curse because we live in a world that wants just enough. How many of you, but hey, two things make me want to preach or preach, bad preaching and good preaching, that was great preaching. How many of you, the car you drive, you don't even look at another one now? That's the one. It's, this is it. For the rest of my life, this car, that's the one. Anybody? 
Any liars in the house? Unless it's a minivan and you're a mom, I understand, but that's different. That's a space shuttle. Has anybody, you've gotten to that place, you're like, I make enough. I need no more. This is... Every part of our life, we spend looking for more. Until we walk in this place. What my daddy had is good enough for me and what my grand... Where God has brought me from, I'm good. And you can go to hell on good. He didn't say enter in, you did good. He said enter in, well done. You cooked everything you could cook out of it. See, here's the problem. If the world was always the same, I won't pick it here. here. You come on, you two. Come here, Brother Colton. Brother Land, you come sit down. Grab that chair. Put Brother Land in the middle. This is where God brought you. And we're like, oh, I love where I am. This is nice. This is wonderful. It worked in the 80s and the 90s and this. And, um, you know, I'm, man, I'm not doing anything that I haven't been, that I like where I'm at. There's just one problem. The world is not the same because the Bible says the world waxes worse and worse. And what you did that was good enough 10 years ago is not good enough anymore. What your daddy had in the 80s, you got to have more than that because of everything that has come into our world. You cannot, there is, the current never quits moving. Anybody ever been fly fishing or trout fishing and you can look down there and man, man that river, we went up to Van Buren and we were watching, man that river go through and it was moving. It looked like that little trout was just sitting in that water standing still. It was doing everything it could just to stay in one place. But in order for them to have life, they've got to go against the current. And they've got to get past the distance. And some of you, the reason years ago you got victory... And now you feel like you're struggling again. It's because you got to a place where you had victory. And in that day and time in your life, it worked. But it's not the same world. And now while you have found a wonderful spiritual recliner and enjoyed the fruit of your labor for a little while, the world and the current has been moving. Pick him up. You're still sitting. Taking this one. But the current has moved. You didn't move, but you're not where you used to be. Now all of a sudden you can sit in. Now all of a sudden you wake up. I'm fighting that same addiction. I'm hooked on that same stuff. My marriage is failing again. I feel lost again. I'm empty again. My, I'm doing what I've always done, yes. But the world is not the same. For you to get ahead, you needed to keep doing more and more and more. I got to dance more than I've ever danced. I got to be more faithful than I've ever been faithful. I got to pray more than I've ever prayed. I got to shout more than I've ever shouted. I got to teach more Bible studies than I've ever taught. I got to be in a prayer and more than I've ever been in a prayer. I got to live more holy than I've ever lived. I don't need less separation. I need more separation. It's a different world and it's getting worse all the time. And I'm going to tell you, give me, where's the armor bearers? Give me four more. Come on, there's one, two, three. One, two, three, four. There we go. Now you just lay down. Yeah, there you go. Okay, y'all pick him up. This is how they take people out in the casket. You think that's funny? Try being the pastor and getting enough people alive to help carry the dead weight. 
I'm the only one not shouting. Yeah, but it's gonna take 10 to make up for the lack of it. Well, I'm just not into that. Then this ain't the church for you. I want you to go to heaven. But we need to see for somebody that wants to live. Now, if you want to wake up, stay and let's be everything that God called us to be and pursue. Now, they can see whatever they want to see. But this ain't one of those things where I'm going to send Brother Bishop Huntley out and we, we need a resurrection. You know what? The Bible says Samson shook himself. Yeah. See, Samson, I got to quit. I'm, I'm, it's just these words. My wife's going to be like, hey, he already preached. I see my own future. Some of you living on borrowed time, and you're in a make or break decision because you're fixing to ever see the greatest breakthrough in your life, or you're fixing to head back to where a long way where God brought you from. The Bible says they tied Samson up, just like some of you feel tied up. But the Spirit still wanted to use him. And the Bible said, Phyllis, the Philistines be him, and he shook him. There was still enough life in him. A preacher didn't have to walk in. They didn't need an evangelist. There was enough in him. There was still enough spirit. He said, I, I want to live. But you stay too long in a place and you don't shake that junk out. You're going to wake up one day and realize the spirit ain't like it used to be. And now I can't shake it off. But you're here tonight. And if you're in this building, right, I don't care what they see. They can say, come by y'all. I could care less because it's not in the song. It's in the spirit. But if you're in this place, say, hey, I'm ready to shake some things out of my life. Get some things out of my home. Get some things out of my mind. Well, I don't have 80 preachers to work the audience. Shake yourself. Make up in your mind. I don't want to be like that anymore. I need a fresh revelation. I need a new strength. It's rest time for a change. In the balcony, in the back, wherever you are, why don't you just begin to lift your hands and begin to reach out? And why don't you shake everything that has started to die, everything that started to feel okay, just being as it's always been. Come on, pray like you used to pray. Let a desperation get a hold of you. Don't worry about anybody else. Shout We're looking now, around you. Now, this is between now, you and shout Jesus. Now, shout now, shout now, oh yeah. Shout now, shout now, shout now, shout now, shout now, shout now, oh yeah. Go away, go away, go away, go away. Go away. Go away. Shout now, hey. shout now, shout now, shout now, shout now, shout now, shout now, oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah.
when the praise team is not up here on the platform. It's all right, you can stay in your seat if you want to, and you can pat a cake if you want to, but is there anybody in the building that's got a praise deep down on the inside of you that said, I don't need a praise team to tell me what to say. I don't need a song to sing. All I need is a great big God and an opportunity to give him some what. I just wonder if there's anybody in the building that came with the praise on your lips, that came with the dance in your feet. Is there anybody in the house that can just shout because he's good, shout because he's worthy, shout because he's holy? It's in your hands now.
morning. Can anybody get excited about somebody going down in Jesus' name today? Come on, if you're in the house and you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, this morning is your morning. Come on, we'll baptize you in Jesus' name. You can leave.